you probably noticed that I did not make an interstitial video between episodes one and two, uh, partly because too many other things were going on. And also, uh, there isn't much to tell. The first huge page of notes, or rather teeny tiny writing on a small page of notes that I used to prep for episode one was primarily reminders of rules. This time, the only rule reminder that I had uh, was to mention that people could table talk a lot, that it's okay in primetime adventures textually to kind of chatter, to you know make comments, to suggest, to kind of serve as a, a Greek chorus, not toward the fiction so much as toward one another. Now, there is a danger in that. It can turn into story workshopping very, very quickly. And that's one thing that I'm always cautious about. But that doesn't really seem to have been a problem here for a number of reasons. So anyway, I just reminded people they could do it. I was concerned that we would have sort of producer talk, you know, s s scene player talk, producer talk, scene player talk, you know, Everybody else is kind of sitting around. Now, I paid attention to a couple of things during the episodes, uh, as I always do, which is if people aren't talking, are they engaged? And there's several ways. I mean, you can go by body language, which is a little simplistic. You know, a person, not everybody has the affect of attentive listening when they are, in fact, listening attentively. So sometimes it's a matter of just checking in with questions periodically and stuff like that, or just assessing whatever it is the person does say next and say, you know, oh, well, they're, they're on it, right? They, if they said that, there's, they, were, they were on it the whole time. So that's good. So there's sort of very unspoken communication about that too. Well, in this case, I'm bringing it up because Primetime Adventures has really clearly designated authorities in terms of who can introduce what content about what content. And so a good example is that um, the players have made up their protagonists and they get to define how their connections, or rather the, they get to define these specific things, whether they are connections or um, edges or uh, a nemesis. And so there's a huge difference in terms of non-player characters who are formally associated with yours. Um, a connection, regardless of how the two of you feel about each other, is an asset. Uh, the, when you are drawing cards for your protagonist during play, mechanically, uh, you are operating as their advocate. They are seeking a thing and they are involved they are putting effort into something and your cards are representing this and all the circumstances that favor them and so therefore regardless of how you feel about a connection or vice versa that's how they operate something about the fiction makes them involved i mean it's easy enough just to say okay he's my buddy he's helping me but any number of inter interpretations as long as they have that mechanical or that fictional content which permits or uh, is associated you could say, makes sense with that kind of effect. And Nemesis, interestingly, uh, is mechanically entirely different. A Nemesis does not have any effect on cards at all. They don't get a special card. You know, it's not like the producer gets an extra card, you know, and the, the Nemesis is involved or anything like that. The designation is purely fictional. Um, and furthermore, a Nemesis and a connection, um, I suppose, I suppose in some meta way, you know, someday somebody will conceivably make them the same non-player character, but that's not mentioned in the book. It's not implied in the book at the moment. Let's just be normal and say, okay, there are connections and there are nemeses and they are not the same. Any protagonist, that is to say player character, uh, can have a nemesis if the player has said so. And for no other reason, the producer cannot invent a specific nemesis for that player character, um, even if there is a non-player character who through the course of time becomes to, you know, despise that person, um, that should, the designation and whatever impact that 
on the sheet designation has um, is is decided when the player takes says, oh, you know, maybe for the next season says, you know what, that guy's got to be my nemesis from now on. Um, it is not an in fiction producer decided situational authority phenomenon. All this is to say is that at one point during our session, one player you know, casually mentioned that maybe the connection of one of the other player characters was implicated or involved in or otherwise had a somewhat adversarial or um, more, shall we say, active role, you know, in the maneuverings or backstory or whatever's going on. You know, maybe she's in on it or something like that. Um, the player concerned, the owner, if you will, or the creator of that connection, you know, was concerned. The question is, and this is compounded slightly by the fact that the first player in question was the designated narrator of the conflict at that time and does indeed have the, you know, the authority to bring in certain things, external phenomena in the service of their narration. Uh, however, and significantly, that authority over the connection and other designated things on the sheet is absolute. That's something a narrator or the producer or anybody talking casually at the table cannot override. And given that table talk is more like chatter and is not a consensus based, how about, okay, if then, well, I said it, so now you have to, you know, take it into account. It's not that kind of solid uh, conferencing about what's going on. It can't be. Um, once you kind of settle that down, you say words about that down. It's all of a sudden it's like, well, okay, you know, you said it as table talk, but you can't do that, you know, unless I, for whatever reason, um, and given that there's no indicator in the prior fiction, um, so there isn't a reason. Um, it's it's conceivably not the case that a narrator could do that basically say, ah, this connection of yours, they're up to their necks in this, you know, conspiracy that's affecting you or something. Not going to happen. So these things are actually quite designated. I mean, they're, they're reading what seem like casual statements in the text, but I think the text is actually quite good about stating precisely who has authoritative final say, yes, no, the rubber stamp about any aspect of play. So a tiny bit of discussion after the, the episode um, cleared up any confusion about that. No rule was violated. No content was created in any way that caused any trouble for anyone or overstepped those during play. Um, but you can actually see me, you know, kind of shut it down right when the threat of that loomed. I said, hold on, we're, you know, scattering focus. This is, you know, so-and-so character is the spotlight, let's quit scattering around to what any other character may be doing off screen or has been doing off screen that we've never heard about before, anything like that. That's just, we're here to focus. So anyway, uh, that's one consideration about play that I think is important. Another one um, is the currency of fan mail. We are going to assume that the producer is doing their job and like hurling, you know, budget uh, so that, you know, they're, they're facing plenty of cards and conflicts and that, I mean, I don't do that by difficulty particularly. I do that, you know, in terms of, well, I got a wad there and I'm just going to grab, you know, a wad. How many did I get? Oh, six. Okay. Six cards. Not quite that random, but close. And in this case, um, I want to focus on the fact that you are moving scenes around. You do have a limitation. Um, Max actually asked this early in the, in, in the meeting, and I clipped it out because it was just a technical conversation. But he asked, now, what's the rule on how we move audience pool into individual fan mails? How many? And the answer is, the easiest way to put it is say you are the, the screen player at the moment. You've framed the scene and we're playing and everything. Let's just say, you know, awesomeness happens and everybody's hurling fan mail at you, turning budget into their, not budget, audience pool into fan mail. How many do you get? The answer is each person can give you one. 
for a scene. So you'll get potentially as many as there are other players. The producer can't do it. So that's actually in our case three, but that's a big deal. Um, they have quickly found how important fan mail is to the point where as soon as I, you know, designate my number of cards and move budget into the audience pool, I mean, they're, <laughs> they're, they're grabbing for it already. They're like, all right, well, that was really cool. We didn't have any audience pool before, but we're still in that same scene. That was awesome. Now you're getting the fan mail. So, I mean, practically as soon as I designate it, I mean, they are, you know, moving it on out and that's fine. And the more, the better, really, right, in the game. And I have found that it's a big deal to uh, remind people that maybe we should be thinking, you know, frame scenes early and often. Um, scenes can be short. Um, if scenes are short-ish, then that means that there's more of this, you know, basically more conflicts, more more audience pool and more opportunities, you know, to move fan mail out of audience pool and across the group. And so it's, it's fairly, you know, fairly useful concept that leads us to, you know, what's the, how, how should we clip along in playing scenes? And it's kind of a good question. Um, I have noticed the players have been pretty good about, okay, let's, you know, let's finish there. Sometimes I do it. Uh, one other thing, you may have noticed um, that this that in episode two is a particularly aggressive producer content introduction. Oh, not only do we have a, a named group on the ship, they are up to things and they literally do a you know a ninja attack on two of the player characters. I mean, they are this this is suddenly, you know as one player put it afterwards, you know, suddenly dark political thriller territory. I mean, who, what, what, who knew this was, wasn't this show supposed to be like, nothing's going on. I mean, are we, are we not doing that? What, what's happening? And so I want to let you know, I've been thinking, you know, a lot about this and it is also uh, a, a, just a particularly noticeable example of how I've been handling producer generated conflicts throughout play. Um, I have made them reasonably harsh, you know, hitting fairly harsh, both in terms of frames, framing, you know, the, the few scenes I get the first one per episode, except that Sondra was on it, you know, for the first episode. So I said, well, you know, she's, she's framing already. So I'll just I'll, I'll run with it. But the technically the first scene of every episode and then second, and uh, significantly just I have to wait until everybody else does before I do it. So I don't really frame that many more scenes than anyone else. But what I do is I definitely say, all right, whose issue is it? And who's got their issues up and running, whether it's two or three, and I'm going to do something with it. Um, so, however, what about the content of the conflicts that I bring in, particularly external information, things that aren't on the character sheet? Nobody has the midnight truth on their character sheet. No player has um, intimated, you know, of, of any such thing. However, I am working off of the determination of two, at least, possibly three, um, players who are driving towards seeking out this, you know, they, they have issues of identity, they have issues of trust, they are seeking out these things that, uh, you know, that, that mean something. They're up to something. Somebody's up to something, right? Well, given a couple of points here, first of all, I am thinking of this mega workplace, you know, just almost a science fiction distillation of the workplace, you know, monstrous world unto itself, um, cruising about for, you know, profit-based reasons um, on a fixed schedule and, you know, you do your job. Um, I've been thinking about that in terms of what goes on. And my take, cynical as it may be, is that corruption is everywhere changed plans based on, you know, secret deals happen all the time. Uh, cover-ups happen all the time. Uh, the factionalism 
you know, everywhere of different kinds uh, is going on. And that's just business as usual. You know, does or does not the ship make its industrial circuit and is or is not some form of, you know, profit gained by the people who want it, both in the biggest picture possible and also in smaller ways, you know, this or that contract or this or that promotion or whatever. I mean, effectively think of it as any such workplace turned into its little own, you know, its its own little cosmos. Um, And the answer is if you're going to seek out corruption, if you're going to seek out conspiracies, you know, in the sense of, you know, bad people, basically cabals, right? You know, bad people doing bad things and advantaging themselves from it. Um, No conspiracy necessary, right? People do that. Um, If you look for that kind of thing, you're going to find a bunch. Now, elevating it into, you know, the truth, the secret, the reason behind it all, or, oh no, we're caught in their trap, you know, they must be stopped, that sort of thing. That I have definitely not presented, and I have watched. I've been walked into a situation by the activities of protagonists who are determined to do it. But I'm the one who, you know, owns the content. I have authority over the content. And, you know, just so you know, and I had to reassure a player about this and kind of show more of my internal workings than I would prefer to do so overtly. I would just like to play it and not, you know, not reserve it for a revelation. So much as just I want to play it rather than talk about it. But the fact is, the Midnight Truth are a bunch of bozos. They are just more Gerards, just more Nias. Uh, they've managed, they've had more time, that's all. Um, and so that's why they've got a little more organization and they've got a, you know some nasty resources they've cobbled up from this or that contact. And that's it. That's it. They've, they've, uh, they've, the, the two of them convincing one another you know, of, of the, 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 the conspiracy and then other cons- you know people conspirators in the sense of conspiracy enthusiasts um who've gotten to the point of being kind of literally dangerous at least to somebody i mean take over the ship i mean i i have a real monolithic view of this workship you know the notion there is no auxiliary control that you know the a tiny ragtag band can suddenly you know hop to and oh they've taken control of the ship you know good luck as in, forget it. So this is an interesting point um, that I'm looking forward to. We've got a spotlight episode for Mark and for Nia and uh, at simultaneously. And that was sort of, you know, my governing aesthetic for the Midnight Truth or anything like them. So just letting you know uh, a little bit more about where things come from um, and, and how they're played. Who has the job? Anybody can suggest Table Talk is wild in primetime adventures, although I think we're going to cut it down. It's cacophonous on screen, and I think we're going to have to be a little more, uh, uh, you know, parliamentarian, you know, about, you know, I, hands are one thing. I'm thinking that maybe something a little more over, you know, shiny cards or something. Well, anyway, uh, that's that. And I hope you're enjoying it. But bear in mind, this isn't just consensual chit chat about what's going to happen next or what's going on. We've got our jobs. They're <laughs> no pun intended. Um, and coherently played with an understanding of what you can say and what it means when what you say is what it is. Um and what has been said that you must honor your, your working constraints. Um, they're quite nice in primetime adventures and they're not much different from ordinary role-playing. It's just here they have names. <laughs>